there is you. Good evening, and welcome to our debate, which tonight will look at the origin of morality. I'm Evan McClanahan. I'm the pastor of this congregation uh, and the moderator for tonight's debate. And as one who fast forwards through all the boring introductory things on YouTube, I'm going to try to make this as quick as I can. First, who's ever been to a debate like this, a formal debate? A few of you. Okay, good. Yeah. They're not held very often. Churches, I think every church should have an occasional debate, and uh, philosophers like to debate. So uh, given that Evan is a member here, uh, we figured that made sense to host a debate. Um, but a few logistics. Um, if you are in need of a bathroom, they're in a hallway right behind me. So go in that door or that door over there. There's a hallway. Just make yourself at home. Um, and there are restrooms back there. We will have a reception afterwards, so please stay and argue some more. Uh, there will be some punch and cookies and all kinds of good stuff. And um, if you like these conversations, a shameless plug for my own podcast. Uh, there's mention of it in your program. It's called Sin Boldly. It's a radio show done through KPFT 90.1 FM. Um, and our format for tonight, uh, there will be 15-minute opening remarks. So each speaker will have the opportunity to make their case for 15 minutes. Then there will be two rounds of eight minutes of cross-examination. So each participant will ask questions, direct questions of the other, and the other is expected to give a direct answer in return. So that will be 32 minutes total of that. Then there will be 20 minutes of open discussion between our participants and then some time for your Q&A. You do have a white sheet of paper in your program uh, where you can indicate who your question is for and what your question is. Half of the questions I get at these things don't get read because I can't read them. So um, try to make uh, the writing as legibly as you can, and uh, hopefully we can get through them all. Uh, with those for formalities behind us, I just want to say a quick word about this particular debate. Uh, the focus of tonight is the origin of morality. And so behind that is the question, why is anything really and truly good or bad? What is the standard that we appeal to in our law, in our culture, in our outrage even? What is our ethical and moral foundation? Philosophers have debated those questions for millennia. Fortunately for you tonight, you will have the answers. Our speakers tonight are Mr. Evan Frisk and Mr. Travis Ross. Professor Frisk is an instructor of philosophy at the Houston Community College's central campus. He holds a master's in philosophy from the University of Houston and a bachelor of arts in philosophy from St. Thomas University. Professor Ross was a longtime instructor in philosophy at HCC, San Jacinto, and Lone Star Community Colleges. He earned a master of philosophy from the University of Houston and a bachelor's in philosophy from Texas State University, San Marcos. Thank you again for coming out tonight, and please welcome our first speaker, Professor Evan Frisk. Good evening. As a member of First Evangelical, I'd like to again welcome you into our church. Special thanks to Professor Travis Ross for being my debate opponent tonight, uh, to Pastor Evan McClanahan for giving us space and opportunity, and to all the various volunteers here tonight. I will argue that morality comes from nature along Aristotelian lines. Aristotle argues that our ethical goal is not simply to feel pleasure, to meet our duties, societal expectations, or being powerful and assertive and making our reality, or making our will reality. In fact, Aristotle says to merely do what is good is not enough. Aristotle is one of many virtue ethicists who emphasize character traits and intentionally cultivating yourself into a good person. Quite literally, Aristotle is not content until your good deeds have become ingrained within you as part of your identity through habit. Before I continue, I really must discuss a bit of theology. My worry is that my fellow believers will be the first to reject my answer concerning the origin of morality because I'm answering on philosophical grounds and I'm not just quoting scripture. So before I elaborate on my answer via philosophical means, I need to pander to my base. If pushed in the right way, I ultimately will say that God is the origin of morality. 
However, that's not exactly the most philosophical way to phrase my answer. Uh, nevertheless, philosophy is used in our Bible on multiple occasions. One, one of the easy places for me to point is to Romans chapter 1, where Paul says that God's eternal attributes, attributes have been known in the things that were made. This alone should dismiss a Christian's insistence that I merely quote the Bible, uh, Bible verses in a discussion like this. Our own Bible states that we can learn things about God through nature. Therefore, just because my answer is that morality comes from nature, don't write off the fact that nature very well may come from God. With the necessary theology covered, I'll not return to it unless prompted. Aristotle's understanding of ethics should be understood very differently from both utilitarianism and deontology. Utilitarianism values pleasurable consequences and pleasurable pleasurable consequences alone. What is good to a utilitarian are actions that result in pleasure for all and everything else is superfluous. Deontology values a system of duties, usually quite rigid, that push a... Sorry, wrong spot. No, I was right. That push a superiority of reason, logic, and consent of will. What is good to a deontologist are actions that are dutiful and principled. When explained in this way, both of these systems actually share something in common. Both think that good and evil are qualities of actions. Aristotle rejects the idea that actions are the foundation of value. Aristotle doesn't simply want you to do what's good or act from the right motive, but Aristotle wants you to be a good person. He does want you to act in accordance with what's good, but Aristotle wants you to become good, such that your identity is intertwined with goodness itself. Aristotle then focuses his ethics on virtues and character traits. This focus on making good pe people good really sets Aristotle apart from modern ethical frameworks. Let me go ahead and restate my answer. The origin of morality is nature. Aristotle understands nature in a unique way called the four causes. This is kind of complex. You might get confused. Just bear with me. The four causes are material, formal, agent, and final, and it's that final cause that I'm going to focus on. These causes are necessary to understand the existence of a thing and what the thing is. More accurately, Aristotle thinks that explaining what a thing is and why a thing is really is the same question. I think the best way to explain this to you is through an example. So let's use Mount Rushmore National Memorial. That's the, the mountain that has the president's heads in it, right? Okay, making sure. So. Why is there a Mount Rushmore National Memorial? There are, four, there are four possible answers, depending on what exactly we're getting at. First, the memorial exists because there was stone to make it from. If we made the memorial out of wood, plastic, or anything else, it wouldn't be the same memorial. We can also think about material causes in this way. If wood didn't exist, then the podium that I'm at right now also couldn't exist. So for Mount Rushmore National Memorial, the stone is an essential cause of the object. If there were other, if there were different presidents depicted on the memorial, or they even were done in a different order, it would be a different Mount Rushmore National Memorial. The formal cause there is also essential. Artists and workers that made the memorial are also essential in understanding why Mount Rushmore exists. This is the agent cause, or efficient cause, I might also call it later. The final cause, the most important for the discussion tonight, is answered by fo focusing on the purpose, function, or end of an object. The purpose of Mount Rushmore, Mount Rushmore is to honor some of America's most popular and influential presidents, and that purpose is vital in describing Mount Rushmore. Without that purpose, all the other causes aren't sufficient to, to explain it. Final cause applies to everything, including things, that aren't man-made. Our heart is a specific piece of flesh material that is organized as a muscle, has four chambers, and is on the left side of our bodies, formal. I end up being the most proximate agent, and we can credit my parents less proximately for the existence of the heart, this heart in particular. But what must be included to explain heart is that its purpose is to pump blood throughout the body. Without that purpose, it's not even a heart. 
I hope it's clear how these causes can be used to accurately understand the world around us. Aristotle's world, word for final cause is telos. And in Greek, it means all the same things I said earlier, purpose, function, end. When something is excelling in accordance with its telos, he calls it, he calls the thing good, or more specifically, flourishing. This is how we ultimately get morality from nature. Let's take an automobile, for instance. The AC is great, the speakers are new, it's got a cool paint job, recently waxed, the inside has pristine leather seats, but it doesn't start. Uh, the car sits in my driveway and doesn't actually do anything other than play my music and let me sit in the seats. Uh, would we call it a good car? Well, the function of a car is to safely and reliably take you from point A to point B, and because my car is not able to do that, it would be really inaccurate to try to call that a good car. It's bad at being a car. It's not achieving its function. We can do this for living creatures as well. What, the telos, what is the telos of an apple tree? First and foremost, its function is to grow and then ultimately reproduce. If you plant an apple tree in your backyard and it has plenty of water and sunshine, let's say you even groom the area to get rid of pests, competing plants, and you fertilize the ground, but the, the tree still struggles to grow and never gives you apples anyway. We can clearly see that it's not functioning well and should be, ca and should be called a bad tree. The struggle is indicative that the tree the struggle is indicative that the tree is bad at being a tree. That specific phrase there. The function of animals isn't simply to absorb nutrients for growth and reproduce, so things begin to get more complicated. Let's say you visit a horse stable here in Texas. The horses are stuck inside stalls all day, so their mus muscles atrophy. They're sickly because they can't move enough, and perhaps some have thrush, which is an uh, infection they can get in their hoof. Contrast that image with wild mustangs on the plains of Nevada, which are renowned for endurance and hardiness. Which horses would we call flourishing? Quite obviously, the horse that's flourishing is one with more open space, health, endurance, running speed, etc. The wild mustangs are great at being horses, while the horses stuck in their stalls are struggling. Note that this is no fault of their own. A horse that's struggling to flourish isn't necessarily blamed for its condition. They need a better environment, and ultimately being stuck in stalls and neglected is not conducive for the flourishing of a horse. Finally, we come to human beings. The function of human beings includes much of the function of other animals. We, have to, we need to be able to maintain our own health, we need to be able to socialize, etc. But human beings also have a rational faculty. Part of our function, then, would be to think and think well. Creativity, invention, and the deeper relationships that come with our natural reason must also flourish in the same ways that our bodies should. So how do we define good person and bad person? Well, a good person is one that flourishes in accordance with their telos, they maintain health and prosperity, they're in good standing with their community, and they understand at least some of the truths of this world. A bad person would be one that doesn't really maintain their health, that is either alone or desperate for social interaction, that is lost and confused as to what is true and why. While the former is living a good life, the latter can hardly be said to be flourishing. To get to some specifics on how Aristotle works out exactly what people do, he turns to virtues, which are habits, that cause us to excel at being good, at good human beings. An easy example is health. If you eat too much, you're not going to be healthy. And equally, if you eat too little, you're not going to be healthy. Equally, sorry. Def excess and deficiency are both bad. Virtue, then, is usually between two vices, which are bad habits. Virtue of courage, for instance, is between its deficiency, cowardice, and its excess, recklessness. These habits are all good when they are, these habits are all good when they are working in accordance with our telos. There is no virtue of theft, no virtue of lying, no virtue of isolation, precisely because these things have nothing to do with the function of a human being. When we understand our telos, it becomes clear who we are and what we are meant to do. A very important virtue tonight will be magnanimity. The magnanimous person is one that's greatly esteemed, has many virtues, has great friends, 
has a great education, and knows it. The man knows of his greatness, and he knows he doesn't have to be submissive to powerful people. He himself is one of those powerful people, and he's not going to be controlled or manipulated. Even if there are crowds of of commoners against him, he stands firm on the greatness that he has. He refuses to be a slave to the mob or to some great authority. This man is his own master, and he deserves the title. The excess of magnanimity can be called hubris or pride, and a deficiency can be called slavishness or submissiveness. Slavishness, sorry, or submissiveness. This would mean that Aristotle thinks that people can be too humble, or at least, at the very least, humility is not good in all situations. We can deal more with this later if needed. What I wish to drive home is that greatness comes from our telos, just like any other good. Telos is part of our nature, and it necessarily prescribes our ethics. Also, remember the the horses that we talked about that are not blamed for their lack of flourishing. This would equally apply to people. At first, we often blame criminals for their wayward ways and then and the harm they cause to society. However, what environment did they have? And do we expect them to flourish in such an environment? Do we really think that people flourish in all environments? And certainly not. We learn that somebody had a really hard life, especially in childhood. We tend to forgive many of their mistakes. In the same vein, if someone has a particularly hard life, yet they overcome and flourish nonetheless, we praise all the louder. Given a poor environment, they still flourished. And we think that they are great people. Aristotle's ethics system is able to account for little things like praise and blame seamlessly well. Let me all... Well, no, I don't need to cover that. Travis throwing curveballs at me last minute. In this debate, it's going to be my job to defend the thesis that nature, specifically Telos, is the origin of morality. I'll almost exclusively use Aristotle, but early ethical philosophy is absolutely dominated by similar themes. Professor Ross will be relying on Sartre and Heidegger, but this might make for a rather passive debate. There's a lot in common with uh, many of these existentialists, and so we'll talk about the agreement that these guys have as well. Ultimately, we're still going to disagree on the origin of morality. And as for the existentialist answers, that's Travis's job. Thank you. All right. uh, Thanks, uh, Evan, uh, Pastor Evan and philosopher Evan, for inviting me letting uh, a heathen into your sanctuary. Very nice of you. Um, so like Evan said, actually, I think there's actually, there's, there's going to be a lot of points of agreement between us. Um, uh, I, I'm actually maybe calling for an update of Aristotle more than anything else. Um, so the question, the questions, the two questions that we're, we're uh, dealing with tonight, uh, what is morality and where does it come from, um, seem straightforward enough, but the answer is uh, unfortunately not so much. Uh, the first question, what is morality? I, I, I could start off by giving a, a pretty straightforward definition of morality, kind of a workaday uh, definition. Um, you know, morality, we could just look at it as the, uh, uh, the discipline or the, the, the examination or evaluation of human actions, uh, the standards of human action and interaction. How should we act and why? Um, perhaps that, that definition is a little too broad um, so I might have to maybe uh, specify or qualify uh, a little bit more. Um, but again, the, the definition I'm starting with here, it's a, an examination or, or an evaluation of uh, the standards of uh, human actions. So kind of the, the evaluation of evaluations. Uh, again, maybe too broad. Uh, we talk about evaluating things and having values. And, and, and when we use that term value, we don't always mean mor- moral values, right? Um, Questions that I, you know, like with the examples I just gave, uh, what is a good life? Uh, you know, how should I act and treat other people? Uh, why is killing wrong? Uh, how should we organize a society in the, the most just manner? Uh, these are ethical questions that demand ethical answers, right? Um, so these are moral evaluations as opposed to, um, 
you know, like economic evaluations or mathematical uh, evaluations, uh, a mark that I might put on uh, one of my students' papers. So what, what distinguishes these two types of valuing, right? Moral values from just, uh, 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 I guess, you know, mathematical or economic values, right? Um, I want to say that, that the ethical values are always going to be qualitative and never quantitative. In other words, um, they can't be measured, right? Um, when I make a mark on a student's test and I give them um, a grade on their paper, right, that's a number, that's a measurement of their success on an exam or, or, or whatnot, right? But when I evaluate how much I, I, I value my love for my, my friends, right, that's not something I could put, put a number on or measure quantitatively. Right. Um, again, this this definition might also be a little too broad, and I think that's maybe where we could kind of you know go back and forth and and, and winnow in a bit on, on it. Right. Uh, but the point is, because it's qualitative and not quantitative, because I can't put a number on how much I value my mother and compare that to how much I value pizza. Right. I know I value my mother more. I know that. But I don't. You know, I can't tell you how much more. Right. How much more value? I know it's infinitely more. Um, you know, than something like like a good meal or something like this, right? Um, and because of that, I want to push back on Evan's um, insistence uh, that morality is objective. Uh, that's not to say that it's subjective either, right? I'm not saying that it's it's a matter of um, subjective opinion. Um, so that brings us to the second uh, question, right? Where does it come from? Right? If it's not an objective thing that I can look out in the world and see and measure uh, and verify mathematically, um, and it's, it's, it's not completely subjective, it's not just a matter of opinion, um, then, then where does it come from and, and, and how, can we, how can we evaluate it? Well, I want to argue tonight that, that morality is intersubjective. Uh, I'm going to try as much as I can to uh, avoid philosophical jargon. Um, but it's, of course, going to be a bit necessary. So, again, it's not objective, it's not subjective, but it's intersubjective. It involves a, uh, a meeting of the minds, so to speak, right? Um, now, to me, that's a philosophical answer to the question. There's other ways we could answer that question, where morality comes from. But I'm assuming because we have two philosophy professors here, we should focus on the philosophical question. Um, you know, we, we can look at this historically, as historians, we can look at it um, as anthropologists and try to figure out historically where our values that we live by came from, what group of people created them, for what reasons uh, were they doing this. Um, we can think about it maybe in terms of evolutionary biology and things like that and look at it through a scientific lens. Or we can even look to our language and the way we communicate with each other. I think that our language also reveals uh, how we... Um, organize our world and, and all this. So these are all ways that we can answer the question of where morality comes from. Um, but I don't think those are the philosophical approaches, right? That's what I'm going to argue tonight. I, I think that those are maybe useful approaches, and I think we can learn a lot from those approaches. Um, I think ultimately those are the kind of pro approaches we would need if, if Evan's right, and, and you can find philosophy in nature. If it reveals itself in the natural world, um, then I think that the job tonight of, uh, of, of figuring out where it comes from or what it is uh, is the job of a biologist, perhaps, and not a, a philosophy professor. Uh, but I'm going to push back on that. I, I think it is, it, it's a question, um, maybe one of the most pertinent uh, questions in philosophy. Um, and so where, where does it come from? Um, the philosophical answer, or the philosophical approach to the answer of the question, where morality comes from. Um, I think philosophically, values are always understood as embedded in a world. Right? Uh, when I value something or I see it as significant, whether it's a moral value or any sort of value, right? I value this lectern, the sturdiness that it gives me, uh, its ability to, you know, place this, this, uh, my notes on it so I can see them and, and I'm, it's convenient, the microphone is close to me. All of these have significance to me. And they wouldn't have this significance to me if they weren't a part of a bigger world of things. They're embedded in a, a, ref, a, a, a world of references, a, a frame of references, uh, what Hubert Dreyfus, uh, the late Hubert Dreyfus, would call a referential totality, uh, borrowing um, from Heidegger. And Evan did mention that, that I'm uh, basing a lot of this stuff uh, on existentialist philosophy. Um, 
but really, I, I, I would say that, that a lot of this can be drawn even from Aristotle himself, depending on how you read Aristotle. Um, but yeah, I'm going to read a passage here from Heidegger's essay, uh, The Origin of the Work of Art, uh, because here there's, there, uh, there's a, a passage that, where he explains the notion of a world. What do I mean by a world, right? Um, a world is not simply the earth or the sum total of all things. A world is a framework that we dwell in in which things show themselves as significant and having value, right? Um, so I'm going to read this, this, this paragraph here from Heidegger, and I'll have to probably pause occasionally to sort of explain it, right? Because Heidegger, obviously, he's, uh, he's pretty famous for being uh, very impenetrable with his language. Um, so here's what Heidegger says about world in his famous essay, The Origin of the Work of Art. Uh, Heidegger writes, The world is not a mere collection of things, countable and uncountable, known and unknown, that are present at hand, right? So when he talks about a world, he's not talking about the totality of all facts, uh, all the things that are present at hand. If it were the case, then we could maybe talk about morality objectively, right? Neither is world merely an imaginary framework added by our representations to the sum of things that are present. Okay, so he's saying there, I'm not just projecting it also. This world is not some personal subjective projection. It's not completely subjective, right? Um, he says, world, worlds. That's a very obscure phrase, right? Die, die Welt, Weltet, right? He's using the German, the world, worlds. The world that we live in reveals itself as a world. Um, but when does it do this? When do we see our world as this structure, Right? Um, he says, the world worlds and is more fully in being than all of those tangible and perceptible things in the midst of which we take ourselves to be at home. World is never an object that stands before us and can be looked at. World is that always non-objectual to which we are subject as long as the paths of birth and death, blessing and curse keep us transported into being. Wherever the essential decisions of our history are made, wherever we take them over or abandon them, wherever they go unrecognized or are brought once more into question, the world worlds. The stone is worldless. Similarly, plants and animals have no world. They belong rather to the hidden throng of an environment into which they've been put the peasant woman, and, and Heidegger mentions this woman because earlier he was, um, he was analyzing a Van Gogh painting of some boots, and he was making the case that um, this is an example where art reveals a world. When we look at this painting by Van Gogh, we're not just looking at a painting of boots. We're looking at these worn boots of the peasant woman. It reveals the world of toil and trouble and all of these other things, and it sort of puts us in the environment of the peasant woman. So Heidegger writes, the peasant woman, by contrast, she's not a plant, she's not a stone, she possesses a world. Uh, since she stays, she stays in the openness of being, right? There's this completely infinite horizon of possibilities, right? That's the thing about a world. The world, although it has all these interconnected and significant things, there's an infinite amount of possibilities uh, in which I can see and interpret and understand these things, right? Um, by the opening of a world... All things gain their lingering and hastening, their distance and their proximity, their breadth and their limits. In the worlding, right, when, when the world reveals itself to us, there gather, gathers that spaciousness from out of which the protective grace of the gods is gifted or refused, right? Because we live in a world where there's cars and buildings and churches, we have a space where we can intersubjectively, as subjectivities, uh, gather around things that we call sacred, or not, as Heidegger says, even the doom of the absence of the God is a way in which the world worlds, right? So all of these values, right, all of these uh, uh, things that we value, whether they're moral values or just the value of a glass of water right now that my lips are a little bit parched, right, all of these entail a whole structure of other things, right? No object is, uh, can be understood in isolation, right? I can't understood and understand the phone apart from other people who talk on the phone with me and who compel me. Um, and so for me, the origin of morality is this world, and the world comes from the interaction of people, 
right? We create this world together, right? We create it through our art, through our culture, through our religion, um, through the things that we hold sacred and valuable, right? And this can never be a purely objective enterprise, right? Because we're dealing with other subjectivities which we can't see. We can only talk to and converse with and we can only imagine, right? We can only debate and discuss like we're doing tonight. Um, so this is what I mean by inner subjectivity, right? Um, when I, when I, when I see Evan over here, right, and, and I, I try to convince him of my, my position, there are things about him that are objective to me, right? I can see that he's wearing a, a nice fancy tie, right, that he's looking up here at me and listening to my words and not writing a lot of stuff down, so I hope you got, you know, good questions for me later, right? These are all objective things that I know about him, right? But those are things that are insignificant to me as far as what I care about, right? I care what's going on behind that facade, right? I'm trying to explain things to him. His subjectivity, what Sartre calls his presence in person, that holds a sort of moral, uh, uh, it calls out to me, right? Uh, it, it makes a demand on me that I have to answer. And the fact that I care about that makes me have to deal with that in an inner subjective way. And um, sort of when we talk about art and culture and the things that we value, right, the, the morals that we hold, um, they all originate from this process of inner subjective communion. So I'm running out of time, so I better leave it there. I've got a couple minutes left, but I'm sure that we'll have a lot of time to iron out the details uh, in, in the cross-examination. So thanks for your time. Okay, we've reached the cross-examination portion of our time, so um, we'll continue to take turns back and forth. Uh, do y'all want? Do y'all can y'all keep your own time, or do you need me to tell you when? I definitely need you. Okay. My phone is way too janky for that. All right. And uh, Evan will go first. And go ahead. All right. So uh, I have a number of questions first for clarification. Sure. Um, so you talk about the, the world worlds. Um, that's going to be the, the confusing topic. So right, is, yeah. is world worlds your answer or is inner, subjecti inner subjectivity your answer? Well, when the world worlds, okay, so th this is when, these are uh, moments when we sort of see the structure, right? When we're sort of, when that, that framework that we inhabit is revealed to us. So typically, he says, yeah, in that essay, he's talking about art, right? But his sort of, uh, uh, I guess his archetypal example is uh, when we, uh, when things fail, right? When, when we have something that we really, really value and we don't get it, right? Yeah. Um, you know, he's, he tends to kind of get a little Kierkegaardian. He thinks that, you know, we, we kind of pick one thing that we value above all else and everything else is sort of a hierarchy based on that. Well, we're always disappointed in our life with these things, right? We have a career that we think is going to work out and it doesn't, right? And in those moments where we're disappointed, um, that's when we sort of see the structure itself, right? While we're pursuing the career, we tend to get lost in it, right? When we, get, when we go to law school, we're not thinking about that telos, that final cause, while we're actually studying law, right? But we're it's there, right? We're operating under that assumption that we're moving towards it. It's not until we fail and we get kicked out of law school that we step back and say, oh, geez, like, I live in a society where I want, you know, being a lawyer was something I wanted to do, and now I can't, that's not a possibility for me. So it's usually in moments of disappointment or actually success sometimes, ironically, right? Sometimes we get what we want, and it's not exactly what we expected, right? And so that's another moment when the world worlds, right, when we see, and we can never see it all at once, it's not really an object, right, it's just we're aware that we're a, we're a part of this structure of a referential totality that is really only in place because we have a purpose that, we've, that we're after, right, we have a, a final cause, and once that final cause is gone, then we sort of, it's almost like a momentary nihilism, almost, right, it's sort of like we, we, we no longer care, right, it's, you know, if you ever had your heart broken or something, and people are trying to cheer you up, you know, and you're just kind of like... Gotcha. Okay, so and then also the world worlds, is that second worlds, is that a, uh, is that a verb? It's a verb, yeah. Okay, so making sure I understand. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not quite as weird in the German. It's still pretty weird. Does this mean world of perception? Um, it's, I guess what Kant would call the phenomenal. Yeah, okay. I mean, yeah, but it would include things like, he would say that, that like the Democratic Party is a part of the world, even though it's not, you can't see the Democratic Party, right? Gotcha. But, it, but it's, it's an entity that is a part of our world, right? Gotcha. Um, the, okay, so then that world, would it be, if it's not just perception, is it like a mental framework? Um, 
it, yeah, it provides a space for mental frame. What do you mean by okay. mental framework? Like, uh, I, I, I well, guess it, where, where does the world exist? That might be where a does question. it exist? Yeah. It doesn't really exist anywhere per se. Okay. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's actually it, it's something. You know, where does the Democratic Party exist? Right. That, that's a, it's the same kind of question, right? I mean, is the Democratic Party like a, a sum total of every person that's a member of the Democratic Party ever and its history okay. and all that? Um, I wouldn't say that. I would say, but the Democratic Party does exist, right? Okay. Would it yeah. exist in the minds of those that believed in the Democratic Party? Not as a, like, approve of, but a belief in the its function in the world? Um, yeah, but I, mean, I would say exist in their mind. Uh, they will have a certain relationship to it, which will probably be unique, sure. Okay. Yeah, but but yeah, it doesn't exist in their mind. Yeah, I, I suppose so. Gotcha. Okay, and you also, now you're using final cause and stuff like that as well. Sure. Uh, so now I need your definition of final cause too. Well, it's, it's the purpose, right? So, so you know, for, for Aristotle, right, um, you know, he, he seems to think of uh, the final cause as something innate, right? That every object that's created has a, a final cause built into it, right? And that's what I'm disputing, right? I, gotcha. I'm fine with the idea that, look, if, if you want to have values um, and, and that sort of have any sort of meaning, uh, that's you know what you might call objective. You have to have sort of a frame of reference, right? And a telos would provide that, right? If you have an aim, like a final cause, mm -hmm. right? Then then there's a frame of reference, right? You know, for me, there's no like good in itself, like a platonic good in itself. Um, that's just sort of you know, a non-contextual good. It's almost like say saying left or right or up or down without giving any reference, right? There's an assumption that if I say something good, you have to tell me what it's good for, or you know for who or for what purpose, right? Um, and so I think in a sense that's fairly Aristotelian. The only thing is, again, it's not an innate, right, sort of thing. Okay. Or, so, well, I, I want to, maybe, maybe I, sh I should sort of uh, 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 push back, or maybe uh, not make such a strong crank. Part of it's maybe innate, right? Maybe, maybe the, like given sort of the way you're born and your genetics or something like that, there's only a certain limited uh, 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 spectrum of final causes that you could that you could enact, right? So if you're, um, let's say you're born with no sight, no, you're blind, right? Um, you probably wouldn't like want to be a bird catcher, right? Your goal would not, or not a bird catcher, bird watcher, right? That would catcher. not be, yeah, that would not be a possibility that you would think of probably in that case, right? So I, what I'm sort of different with you, I guess, is that, yeah, final cause is necessary for values, but there's no sort of absolute final cause or one that's innate to me or set in stone. Gotcha. So the, the telos in Heidegger is a, um, is given by the world as like a, and so we're still a passive function, uh, a passive to it's the It's sort telos. of a back and forth, right? It's, it's, okay. a it's a sort of a dynamism more thing, right? See, th this is where I think, you know, you, you, we talked about McIntyre before and I, I, I have a lot of respect for, for McIntyre's work, but I think he does over, uh, he kind of makes a straw man out of the existentialists. Uh, which I forgive him for. I think it's it's the reception of the existentialist has sort of been this way, especially by liter literature professors. Sorry if there's any in the audience. But they, they tend to, I think, read uh, existentialism as, as hardcore subjectivism, where I think, no, there's a there's a strong inner subjective element, right? Sartre and, and Heidegger both talk about facticity, right? That, you know, yeah, I mean, um, it's sort of a give and take, right? You know, you're thrown into a world that opens up these possibilities for you, right? But that doesn't mean anything goes. Okay. Um, I had one more question. Oh, um, the uh, it, for the purpose of the debate, would you say existence precedes essence? Mm, for the purpose of the debate, uh, no, no, I, I don't want to. I don't want to. No, I, I don't. I don't want to go there. No, I don't want to say that. Okay. I, I would say may, maybe. Uh, uh, there is no essence. <laughs> right. There is no all there essence. is is all there is is existence, right? Uh, okay. Well, well, essence essence is something that that sort of uh, is not absolute and, and eternal, right? Okay. So so you know if, if you know you might say that there's something is like the essential thing about this bottle of water is that it holds water, right? But that essence is defined in terms of functionality, right? But there's no sort of like essence of essences, right? There's no sort of platonic archetypal. You know, gotcha. Sort of, right, Aristotle right. also denies all those. Right, right. Archetypes. That's what I'm saying. So I think there's so, a lot of, like I said, there's a lot of sort of uh, ground that where we agree on this. Yeah. On, on stuff. Um, so uh, the only question that I have time for is, um, if there's no such thing as essence, um, then well, how are we supposed to um, have any part of it whatsoever innate? If there's there's nothing, if we start with something, can't 
don't we have a start for an ethnicity? Well, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not denying that, that, okay, so I'm not denying that there are innate characteristics within you, right? Okay. Uh, and and that so, so what you value, right, like how you value things, right, might be a result of some things that are innate, and they might be a result of some things that are environmental, right? Sure. Um, th that's, there's definitely those elements to it. I'm out of time. Oh. Okay. So, um... I, I, I'm kind of, I, I want to push back a little bit on your, your reading of Aristotle, I'm, you know, uh, and again, I'm, I'm open to, to being, you know, refuted. Uh, but, you know, you say that Aristotle, um, he tells us not to, to do what is good, uh, but to uh, develop character traits, develop virtues, right? Is, am I incorrect? In uh, not merely do what is good, okay. but the, it's, it's, not, it's not adequate unless your, your identity is... You couldn't help but be good. Right. That that habit is fully set. So, but to, to me, the way the way I read Aristotle, it seems to me like they're the same thing, right? Like doing what's good and, and being virtuous is the same thing. Like developing virtuous, like so. So the act, you know, when you, when you, when your opening statement, you said, okay, it's not just a matter of doing what's good. It's 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 developing these character traits, and 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 I, I think that the way he describes. Happiness or eudaimonia or whatever this highest telos is for all of us is an activity, right? It's not a it's not a passive trait. It's not a passive thing in me, right? So the, what I'm seeing with you, it seems like you're you're um, you've got this very essentialist view of the individual, right? Like like when I'm born, I'm pretty much my fate is kind of set in stone. Like my possibilities are kind of like already there, baked into the cake. Right, and and, and 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 of course you admit, like Aristotle, nature. Um, you know, sometimes it's not fair, and I don't get the right soil and the right nurturing and all that, and I don't get to develop into this perfect being. Right, we get unlucky. Right, uh, but it's, but yeah. So so it seems to me again, how um, how do I know? You know, how would I discover this? Uh, you know, if myself is always changing. Right? I'm always developing new ideas. I'm always uh, coming up with new, new information. I'm always changing my personality. Um, to me, it seems like it's just a, a fact that, 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 that the, our identity changes, the way we see ourselves. Uh, how do you explain that? Is, is that just sort of we're schizophrenic and, and Aristotle? No. So um, I didn't talk about eudaimonia at all. Um, but so to answer the, the first part of this, the... Uh, Doing good good actions is actually how you gain the habits. Okay. So you've got it. You do the good actions, you gain the habits, and then the habits just do right. themselves. Uh, so it, eudaimonia is when being good is not a struggle, where it's just right. you just, just what a, you do. It, right, right. It just sort of flows from your character, right? Yeah, it right, just right without effort, without thinking about it. Uh, so in the last half, what I would actually point to is that we're always thinking new ideas, and we're always um, uh, doing these various activities that are constantly changing. Well, I would just define that as what we are. Okay. We're a thing that thinks new ideas. Right, right. Yeah, so I use creativity and innovation as two of my examples. But, but it seems to me like, like with Aristotle, you've got this end point, right? So you, you, you hit your goal, you've achieved eudaimonia, and then you just sort of perpetuate virtuous activity, right? You're just sort of like a magnanimous individual. Yeah. That, like always does the right thing at the right time for the right reason. Um, but to me, it seems like, uh, you know, that could be possible in an individual, sure. Uh, but it seems like we're all so unique as individuals that, that there might be, uh, I, I find it questionable, and, and maybe you could sort of push back on this, you know, how, how do you know there is an a, a ultimate good for each of us, right? How do you know that, you know, he defines telos, you know, the final cause in each of us as, as eudaimonia, but he admits that what that means for each of us is unique, right? How do I, how do I know? How do I use reason? To know that I'm doing it right, how do I know that that I'm properly going for my aim? I mean, you would admit that that our my happiness is going to be different from yours, right? Uh, ever so slightly, yes. Ever so slightly, okay. How how how? <laughs> what do you mean by ever so so so? But there's, so there's like general types. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes. Okay. How many? Um, one being one a, general type. So the yeah there. One, one human. Time with slight variation. So we're all the same, guys. <laughs> I, I mean, that, it's, it's a nice sentiment, but really. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. we're we're Homo sapiens. There's no other biological classification that any of us fit into. Of course, yeah. But if you're, you're talking about the sense of biology, we're talking about what the best life is for us. So you're saying that what the best life is for me, and what the best life is for somebody halfway across the world, or somebody living in a completely different situation, the good for me is going to be the same, more or less. More or less, yeah. I, I don't see that as Aristotle saying that, right? We're all born with a unique with unique potential with Aristotle, right? We all have unique potential. If if I'm colorblind from birth, I'm not going to be, you know, getting a job, you know, uh, designing uh, the, the new color scheme for for the the Sears catalog. That's an old reference. You know what I mean? So so it seems like uh, happiness or the best life or the passionate life can take many different forms, and it seems like you're you're oversimplifying it to me. You gotta ask a question, I think. Yeah, like so. So, how, how do you push back on that? How 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 do you explain um, that I can get a lot of happiness talking about philosophy, where I have to offer my students much extra credit to drag them out here to come see it, right? And I and I are they just not right? And I'm and I'm closer to the the ideal of eudaimonia, or maybe they're better off because they're you know. I mean, what? How, how do I determine who's? So there are like four questions in there. I think the. The, the first round of questions all kind of tied into each other. Um, and that was, um, actually, now I've, I've tried to hold on to all of it. Um, how would I push back ag against what again? Clarify that. Well, for me. basically, there, that happiness, I, maybe eudaimonia, right? Self, okay. self fulfillment, self actualization, reaching my highest peace. It right. takes all these different forms, yet you want to say that no, it doesn't. That, that, that um, my, me being virtuous, my, my virtuous activity is basically me be fulfilling my highest potential and being the best individual I can be, which is what he focuses on, is going to be more or less the same gotcha. amongst all individuals. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to say that potency, the, the potential to do this, that, or the other, is already is isolated within our natures. So I don't have a potential to fly. I'm, it's not going to matter how, how right. much I practice flapping my arms. It's not going to happen. So my, my nature is what gives me potency. So I have the potential to think well, and I have potential to be healthy, and I have potential to do these things because I'm human, firstly. Right. Um, if, um, I w if I was a thing that didn't have a body, and to entertain that for a moment, that, that health would be an odd thing to consider, right. or temperance even right. might be an odd thing to consider. Um, so, I, yeah, I think I'm going to say that potential at all, why is it that, um, that I have the same potential as somebody else across the, the world? Is It's the same nature. I don't think we have the same potential, though, right? Uh, we, we all have an infinite amount of potential, I, I would say, right? It's a bound infinite, right? It's bound by certain restrictions, right? Like like you said, I can't fly, so if, I, if my goal is to be Superman, I'm kind of out of luck, right? If my goal is to be Aquaman and breathe underwater, I'm kind of out of luck, right? Um, so, but I mean, I, I would say, though, within that, within that, those bounds, there's infinite possibilities. You just said, you know, I could focus on being healthy or being intellectual or all this stuff. How do I pick which of those infinite possibilities is the right one? And is there only one right one? So, the first thing you said um, is that we have infinite potential. And, uh, but you accused me of saying nice, pretty things earlier, so I'm now going to accuse you of doing well, the same well, thing. Um, but also... Um, I've got to answer the, the last half of that. Um, so, oh, there. Am I allowed to answer? As long as it's my time. Okay, so the, uh, uh, that potential, like within bounds, we have infinite potential. Sure, I'll grant that. There's an infinite number of numbers between uh, zero and one, but that doesn't mean that two is, is a number that I can choose. Well, as I'm so, saying, like, like, I could decide to stand on my head my whole life, right? That's a possibility. I'd probably get really tired eventually and, you know, not be able to do it, right? Yeah, so, well, like, I could spend my life dancing. I could spend my life, I, you know, I could get up and walk out of here and, you know, do some funny jig on the way out, right? But I don't do that, you know? Why is that not the best? Why is it better that I sit here? So, um, you're not allowed to ask questions. Oh, sorry. It's, so, the, um, so now I've got to turn the question around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, why do you think, um, Standing on your head would be best if you're going to get tired, pass out, and fall over. I don't. Good. Let's, yeah, I sounds don't. like we're in right. agreement. Yeah, right. So that, you're subjectivist then? Yeah. It's all based on just me and my feelings? No, let me go ahead <laughs> and get into that. So, all right, I'm ready, I'm ready to try to pin you into a corner. All right, great. So, um, the, um, I've already hint, hinted at um, the, if part of it is innate at all, why don't we have an essence? But you don't want to really push the existence precedes essence thing well, too hard. Well, you can if you want. I mean, I, I, I can expand on that if you want. 
Um, I, I just I just find the idea of essence problematic. Okay. Right. Like when you say the essence, what do you mean? Like essence, like define like the essential characteristic of an object. Yeah, let's go with that. Right. Well, it, the, the the essential characteristic of us is that we don't know our essence, <laughs> okay. and that's an issue for us. Right? So, like that, like the fact that, like I, I mean, that's where I think, man, maybe maybe uh, I might push back on Heidegger, but this is where his idea is that what makes us unique is not that we reason. Animals reason. If you mean reason by just going between choices, like this choice, that choice, which is best, rationalizing that way, animals do that, right? What makes us different is that our existence is an issue for us, right? The fact that we're here is like, why am I here? What's the what's the purpose of it, right? Uh, he doesn't. Why, see- why wouldn't that be an essence? Um, well, the, 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 an, the we're answer, the animal the, the that answer, asks well, the, well, why well, that, we're here. Right. Well, that is that all we are, though. Of course not. Yeah, of course not. But is that the one only essential characteristic of no, it's, humans? It's just part right, of our right. our formal cause. Right. Yeah. You know. So again, I mean, I, I I I hesitate to talk about essences. Right. I think that that's just to me morality and ethics is an open space and it should always remain open. When we talk about essences, like this is me and what I'm supposed to do, period, it shuts off all conversation. And my, my argument is that ethics is intersubjective, right? Okay. It always has to be left open, right? I can never say, well, your essence is to be a good philosophy professor and I don't think you did a good job tonight, so you're a failure. No, that, no I, I, you know, whether you're a failure or not, I still care about you because you're a person, right? And I want, I want to get at truth with you, right? We care about each other. Right to me, that's that. That's why ethics is here. We talk about essences. Yeah. So right? you only do you care for other people because the world worlds. Um, but if the world were to world in a different way, sorry, that's the, yeah. that's the way that it yeah. grammatically yeah. would be. If the world were to w- world in a different way to you, then would you, would you no, not no, care no, about that, that, for, for Heidegger? You know, and, and for me, Thomas, I would agree with him. Uh, th- there would be no world if I didn't care. Right, the, okay. the fact that I care about something, right? I have to care about something for there to be a structure, right? The minute I stop caring, then I mean the world might be still there, but it doesn't have any significance, right? It sort of recedes. This is when I'm sort of like, you know, you're bummed out, you're in a bad mood, you, you know, you see the world around you and people going to work and caring, but you no longer care. Okay. Usually so those, you know, I gotta keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, the world, um, why does it exist? Why does it exist? It exists. That's a question I don't think we can answer, but I, I think that, that it exists uh, probably, if I had to guess, my hypothesis would be it exists because it's, it's a way that we, um, it, maybe it is essential to our, our, our being, right? Sure. As a human being, um, and this might be something that's new, right? Uh, relatively new in our evolutionary development, right? Maybe, gotcha. maybe, you answered my question. I've only got four minutes. Okay, yeah. The, uh, uh, so we, um, uh, it's essential to us. So we, we then, uh, by our being, create the world. Yeah, the way we are, yeah. We, Perfect. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're God. Yeah. Okay. And, and well, we take the role of God, yeah, like together, collectively, right? Well, in, in, a way, in a way, the world itself might be God, right? It depends on what you mean by God. If you're talking about the Judeo-Christian, like, perfect divine being, no. But no, talk- I mean creator of something like that. Like- uh, no, not in the sense of a creator, right? It, that's an object, right? A creator would be a being that created a thing, right? The well, we would be the thing that created the world, Right. We're not things, though, right? Like, your, your, your body is a thing, right? You're, you're, you have an objective presence here, right? But there's something about you that's not objective to me. I don't see your mind. I can't see your mind, right? Okay. All I see is the way you act, and, and I'm assuming there's a mind behind all those actions, yeah. right? And, and, and I, I'm, I'm trying to convince you of my position, and you're doing the same with me. We're acting on each other's subjectivities, right? Yeah. We're acting on what we can't see. It, it is a big assumption that I have a mind, though, so don't yeah. hold that yeah, for so a while. That's what he was saying the, to one of your students before. The... Um, uh, if I were to, uh, um, if I were to strike your body, did I hurt you? Uh, depends. You gotta hurt me. You gotta strike me first. Yeah. <laughs> I'd have to strike you first. I, I'd have to, I can't tell you a priori. Man, I, if that's I, how I, I'm gonna have yeah. to win this debate. I, I, yeah. I can't, I, I can't tell you. I don't know how hard, I don't know, I don't know, do you, you know, I don't know how hard you hit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, um, it possibly would. It possibly would hurt me, right? But 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 again, you know, the word hurt, right? That means I'm feeling pain, right? I mean, there's a sensation of pain, right? Yeah, sure. So, what does that have to do with moral values, though? How does, um, how does the idea that um, we we play in with the world that there's this is dim- dimensionism um, coincide with things like evolution or just? regular science. Well, I, th- I think science and evolution are attacking this problem from a completely different angle. And I think it's a useful angle, 
right? But, but so, you know, a lot of people that are anti-Heideggerian, they think he's anti-science. He's not trying to answer the question of ethics from the scientific. He's trying to, and, and, and I'm also getting a lot of this from Levinas as well, right? Uh, the, the, the French philosopher. You know, it, it's, 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 um, sorry, what was the question again? Oh, uh, now I've already forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, how does this, how does this compatible with science? Oh, how's it compatible with yeah. science? Well, science is another, is another, um, example of a world worlding, right? Like, like a sci science is a perfect example of, of an endeavor that's very sort of ethical or intersubjective, right? Gotcha. When we talk about science, um, and we, we talk about scientific obje objectivity, right? Uh, well, we're not talking about a view from nowhere. We're not talking about this platonic, unbiased position. We're talking about a consensus amongst scholars who are all in, in this endeavor, a gotcha. human endeavor that's a part of a world where we know we're biased and we know that we have experiences that no one else gotcha. has had. Does, so, does cause and effect exist? Uh, Objectively? Like in yeah, this well, yeah. Like, again, okay. depends on what you mean by objectively, but yeah. I so, like, say, I, yeah. I put a pot of water on the stove. Yeah. I light the stove. The, 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 right. It causes the pot to boil. Cause the water to boil, let me be specific. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah there's cause um, and effect. So then, um, cause and effect wise, your body is subject to that at the very least, and sure. you're going to get hungry. Right. So do you need to eat the, the Travis? That's the, the mind Travis. behind, behind my, the body. My, yeah, my body, yeah, I need sustenance. Yes. Does, does the mind need, I guess, yes, does, does Travis need to eat? What, who's Travis? What's Travis? <laughs> so, so in order to get around the question, you have to deny your own existence. Well, no, I, I have to deny. So, when you, you talk about a self, right? You're talking about a thing. You're, you're treating it as if it were a thing, right? I think this is the big problem with our language, right? Our language sort of lends itself to this confusion. Uh, we always sort of see things in a subject predicate form, right? And so, we, when we talk about I, Travis did this, Travis did that. Um, you know, what is the permanent thing under underneath that, right? I think it's more of it's a process. It's not a gotcha. thing or an entity. So is it my turn to mm -hmm. get tear into you? Okay. Um, so I've got a lot of stuff I wrote down and I haven't even got to yet, but so let me <laughs> see. If, uh, you quoted a, a passage from uh, uh, the Paul's epistle to the Romans, mm -hmm. uh, something about uh, the, the known in things that were made, were made, right? That, that uh, uh, I guess this idea that, that nature reveals the right or the good to, to, to us, right? How does it do that? Right, like what? How do I look in nature? How can I look at like a, a plant for say, uh, per se, right? Uh, for instance, uh, and, and understand its nature and its natural processes and derives good from that. Okay, so um, you didn't ask the theology question. I thought you were going to. So the uh, uh, you would know things through uh, through causes. So um, what a plant is is the uh, the kind of thing that's formed in such a way that it's receiving nourishment from photosynthesis and from gathering up nutrients in the dirt. Why? Because uh, that's the thing it is. I, mean, I, I couldn't think why? of... Why? <laughs> why is it that way? See, because you just said, like, in, in, in one of your remarks, you said that the what and the why are the same. Yeah. I disagree. When you say that, that um, you know, what a thing is, right, you're not necessarily giving a justification for it. Well, it depends on what you mean, right? If, if I say that, you know, this is a glass of, or this is a bottle of water, if you understand what a bottle of water is, then it's implied that you know what its use and its purpose is for. But I don't think that applies to every object, right? If you just describe a natural process, right? I mean, I'm, I'm getting basically to the, the is ought fallacy, right? The naturalistic fallacy. How do you circumvent that? How do you derive an ought from an is, basically? I actually wrote a whole thing about the naturalistic fallacy, and that was the chunk that I skipped. Good. I'm glad I brought it up. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, um, so naturalistic fallacy, my, my students in ethics have already gone over this, um, so they can, uh, uh, hopefully they remember that right. there's, so there's I mean, an if something's unnatural, gap. it's bad. If something's natural, yeah. it's good, right? Yeah, so, so how do you determine what's natural? So it, natural? it was originally used for John Stuart Mill because he was saying that we desire pleasure and therefore pleasure is desirable, therefore pleasure is good, and desire and desirable are not the same words yeah. there. Um, the... Um, the idea that this is analogous to Aristotle uh, is mistaken. Um, Telus cannot be described as simply something that is like a desire, but it is exactly the kind of things that directs what is to what ought. A living organism, simply because it's living, it's designed as living, it exists as a living thing, is designed uh, to continue living its life in various ways. So th the plant, it would take... The plant doesn't even have the potency to commit suicide. 
it's it's going to live. It doesn't have a choice. Right. And so that design that's already there is kind of directs it already. Right. So for why is that good? Um, because it is the thing. Like that's what does that mean? It is the what thing? It's it's good in because those are the goods of the of the object. The goods of the object are those that. So it's good for the plant that it grows, but how is it good? Like universally good. That's actually what Aristotle means by by universally good. Okay, well then I got to push back on that, right? I mean, how how can you say that? So let's say the plant grows and it flourishes, and it's a poisonous plant that kills the the village nearby. That was good. It's good for the plant insofar as that's part of the plant's flourishing. Well, see, there you go. So you're basically agreeing with me. There's no context. There's no non-contextual good, right? And and so you're you know you're saying, oh no, well, what what's good for me and what's good for somebody across the world that's different is more or less the same. Uh, I'm saying no, it depends on their environment, it depends on their culture, it depends on what their aim is and what their desires are. And that might be something that's built into their genetics or, or, or response to their environment. Sure, I'll grant you that. Um, but I'm just not seeing this. I'm not seeing how you can just go from, okay, well, the plant does what it does, and so that just must be good because it does that. I mean, I don't, you got to fill the gap there for me. So based on the idea that you've, you grant me that um, things have, um, Genetic predispositions, at the very least. Right. Um, the the form of a of those genetic predispositions is to attempt to flourish in whatever environment environment it finds itself. But what if those forms evolve? Are you going to allow for evolution? I do. Yes. Okay. So yeah. if if they evolve, does that mean what's good for a plant like a million years ago might not be the same that what's good for what it evolved into a million years from now? Uh, for Aristotle. It, yeah, the, the, as long as it's a different species, it has an entire difference. So you're kind of like a relativist then? Like, like values are relative depending on what nature's state, what the state of nature is in? So it it's like a be, naturalistic relativism? It wouldn't be relativistic at all. Relativism would definitely be the wrong word to describe that. Contextualism I, at the very least. Yeah, so it's, um, it, it would be, so that I would say the telos is based on form. Um, so, f and form is, s required for any sort of object to exist. Um, so, so, so explain form, like Aristotle's form. So uh, it's easier to start with Plato's form. Can I start with Plato's form? So Plato's form is that um, you have an object and it um, really what it's doing is the, the perfect object exists up in heaven and is communicating through the world to you and it's a shadow. Um, for Aristotle rejected Plato in this way um, he thought the actual form was in the object, but largely the, the way you can think about form um, has to do with shape or organization or structure or something to that extent. Well, for, yeah, but also too, it's it's you know, he uses the term form and actuality inter interchangeably, right? So the form is what it actually is. The yes. matter is its potential, right? Correct. Yeah. So I have I'm made up of matter potential, right? And, and and because of that matter, I'm able to take a form, right? But, but form changes for Aristotle, right? The plant it turns from a seed to, to roots to a plant, right? As it goes through these changes, right, how can you assume that these changes are always directed towards something that's good? So that's not what Aristotle means by form. It, form never changes for a thing. If form changes, the object is not the same thing anymore. Uh, we have a different understanding yeah. of Aristotle then. Yeah, for, for, you know, for, again, what, what, what a thing actually is changes, right? I was actually a four-year-old at one point, and now I'm actually not, right? But when I was a four-year-old, I had potential to become what I am now, right? I'm not going to tell you my age. Um, so, so if form is understood as, and also, too, one, one way he defines it in, in, in the, the, the uh, posterior analytics, he says that form is what makes an object similar to other objects, right? Mm -hmm. So the bottle of water, that's its form. That's not the only bottle, right? If there's another bottle, right? Mm -hmm. It matters what separates it, right? But how can you look at the form, what it actually is, and infer from that what it, you know, that it should be that, or what it should be directed towards? I'm just not seeing that. Right? When I see this bottle of water, I'm like, it's good that it is the way it is because it's holding water to help me drink it. But that's good for me and in this context of a world, right, where people get thirsty and they need a drink, right? But isolated by itself on its own, just considered as an, an object, how can I say that it's good that it's that way just because of its so nature? So we, we do this all the time in archaeology. We, we find tools and we figure out what they were used for. We find... We guess what they're used for. We, we, we speculate. So I, I, we could find, uh, let's say that What was the Baghdad battery used for? 
Uh, I don't know what don't a Baghdad need, battery is. The Baghdad is. battery was a, is I, one of the oldest uh, pieces. It was found in Baghdad. I think it's uh, maybe like 4,000 BC. We're out of time. But yeah, nobody knows what it's used for, but it was a battery. Right? It had copper. And... I'm done. Yeah. 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 Okay. We're going to enter a 20 minute period of kind of open conversation. Um, and I'm going to use my position as moderator to get us get started here and try to kind of frame what I've been hearing. Um, your philosophy students may have heard some of this in class, but for those maybe not in philosophy class, I want to try to kind of bring some um, some context to all this, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So if y'all have questions, this will be the time to write the question in, or as you're listening, write in a question, and then we'll pass those to the front and pick those up at the, at the end of this 20 minutes. But I want to begin by trying to make sure I understand each of your positions. So when you talk about intersubject, say again? Uh, uh, intersubjectivity. Subjectivity. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so my understanding of what you're saying is that essentially if a group of people agree that something is good, then that's sort of good enough because things change, forms change, times change, morals change, values change. So, and since we don't have an essence of a thing, um, I mean, in, a, in 30 seconds or less, am I, am I kind of hitting the mark? Yeah, you're on, you're on the right, I would say more or less correct. Okay. I would say that it doesn't, you know, because we agree doesn't sort of, it's not good enough, it's just as good as we can expect okay. in our state, in the okay. state that we're in. Okay, so you would say that Aristotle saw that things had forms, they had a, an end, they had a telos. So a human being had a telos, he had a purpose to his life. And so what would be good would be those things that would help that human being flourish. Yep. Okay, okay, that's, that's okay. All right, so I want to I wanna try to bring a few examples to play, modern examples. If y'all don't want to answer to these, that's fine. Might get you in trouble with your bosses or students or something. But... Um, but we kind of live in a real world where we're, where we're faced with these, you know, perhaps ethical dilemmas or differences about a moral issue of the day. So I would like to ask about, say, same-sex marriage. Okay, so given your frameworks, why would it be right or wrong to endorse same-sex same -sex marriage? So uh, Aristotle was notoriously anti-homosexual, um, which really was awkward because... Uh, Alexander the Great was probably gay, and that was his uh, his student. So, the uh, um, Aristotle would say that sexual organs have have telos, um, the uh, the form of given sexual um, organs do uh, certain things. the The idea that we have a reproductive system at all to begin with sounds like that it's for reproduction, um, or at the very least directed in that way. So something like um, homosexuality would be immoral and not fulfilling a, how do I put it, uh, and not flourishing as a um, thing. So the, a human being, um, as a male or as a female, would have to understand their telos and function accordingly. And, and so if they were in a same sex, that wouldn't be fulfilling a telos. That, that would be so there, there are different teloses that, that could be yeah. uh, fulfilled. So um, the idea of romantic partner or something like that, that seems to be a telos. Right. Um, but it's r romantic partner um, with who and why and how. Like the, so there's different kinds of, of ends that are fulfilled. Right. Um, there's, uh, but the, uh, I, would, I just interpreted the question as, as like, uh, it is, is something like sodomy acceptable? Or, right. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so, so that would be, I think, the, the way that we have agreed to, to see that particular question for for centuries, but obviously we live in arguably a new day, so we're defining marriage in a new way. Um, and so this is something as a society we've talked about, Hollywood's had its impression, judges have ruled, laws have changed. So is that just one of those things that evolves? I mean, is, is Well, sure, our social mores evolve, but I think that what doesn't evolve, what doesn't change is the fact that all of us are trying to cope with our existence, we're trying to live lives that are, you know, we give us value and meaning and that we care about. And, and I think that, uh, you know, we've tried to find an answer for this for everybody, a sort of cure-all, right? And I think that's why we come up with these, you know, with things like 
philosophy and religion and dogmas and things. But I, so, so to me, we, we need to sort of be uh, humble about this, right? And, and be open to another person's experience. If they find happiness and meaning and significance in some relationship that is not traditional, perhaps by the society standards, uh, as long as they're not forcing others into some, you know, compromising position where their possibilities are limited, I don't see really any, any conflict. Okay, I want to ask another question, another in the same range. Um, let's say a couple, a husband and wife, agree to have, an, shall we say, an open relationship. Um, and it's agreed upon by all, so there's no, uh, there, there's no, there's no conflict about it per se. Biblically, we would call it adultery. But again, using your forms uh, or your, your standard of how you would determine what is right or wrong, what would, what would you say about a, a, a voluntary, agreed upon, open relationship in a marriage? So, Aristotle doesn't have a problem with divorce at all. Aristotle doesn't, uh, does have a problem with adultery in particular, though. Um, and so if it wasn't adultery, I think Aristotle would just be widely confused. Uh, he would have, he probably has no concept of what an open relationship would be. Um, he understands polygamy and probably would just include it as that, that there's a kind of polygamous relationship going on. Um, Aristotle wasn't necessarily even against polygamy. Uh, the, uh, uh, Aristotle thought women were way lower than what we think of them now. And, uh, that the, the greatness of a man might require multiple wives in that way. Um, and I, I would, there wasn't like the, in ancient Greek, there were wedding services and you didn't need to go and sign the contract that to say that you were married either. Uh, he would just say that, that like there's this husband goes and does whatever he wants and the wife is okay with that. And this Jesus, these just look like his other, his other, uh, um, wives. Um, yeah. I guess I would kind of answer like, Aristotle did just that. I mean, in a way, it, it, to me, it seems like the, the issue is whether um, it's it's really authentically open, right? Are, are they are they doing it because this is really what they want, or or are they just is one of them unhappy and, and is thinking, you know, again, I think this is very situational, it's very contextual. Uh, to me, the issue is mutual respect, right? Are they being authentic with each other, right? That's the, that's the only way inter, intersub, uh, intersub, subjectivity can work. I mean, if, if you tell me things you don't really believe sincerely, I've really got no way to communicate with you in a, a good moral way, right? That's That opening is closed off for me, right? So if, if, you know, I have no problem with, I would say, you know, this sort of ethics, this intersubjective ethics would have no problem with open relationships as long as they were actually authentically yeah. open. Right? And, and just, just to put in my own two cents, not this will be the last time I do this, but um, from my point of view, what, what the church, you know, like, what Christians, I think, are fighting for is the ability to retain the right to say this is a thing that, that absolutely is wrong. Um, and so uh, a prevailing ethic that essentially says, well, as long as a certain number of people agree to it, then it can be right. That's what, you know. Well, I, I don't want to make it sound like some democratic ethics, right? I mean, if you have an absolute abhorrence for open relationships, right, that's completely your right, right? And, and I, I respect your right, right? I think that uh, to me, you know, in a way, maybe I, I do think ethics, at least our personal ethics, comes from nature in a certain sense. It comes from our gut. It comes from our heart, right? And if you get a guttural reaction to that, if you it really just, it, you know, hey, man, if you live your life the way you, you want to live it, and if you really feel that deeply about it and it bothers you that much, yeah, I agree. Yeah, go ahead. But that doesn't give you the right to impose your dogma and force others into that. Unless, again, there's a pushback, right? If, if, if they're forcing you to do something that goes against your sacred values, right, then there's no inner subjectivity. They're treating you like an object, and they're forcing you to, all you can do is treat them like an object and push them away. So for inner subjectivity to work, we have to be open to conversation. Let, let me ask one more question then. Or, or go ahead. Uh, okay, so that um, if we move beyond Aristotle and we start considering virtues of women, um, which I definitely think we, that we should, um, that's when I would start saying that open relationships become degrading. Um, depends on the woman. Depends yeah. on the individual. Uh, well, I would say that it's, it's degrading naturally based <laughs> well, society, on society has dignity. You know, obviously, society has has you know built up this image of you know a woman who. who is open, is promiscuous, is somehow less of a woman or something like that, right? So that that's definitely, you're right, you know, it, it would have that effect on her, but it doesn't necessarily have to, right? Well, so I'm thinking yeah. of, the, it's the it's the guy that's having the open relationship and the girls are, are, are just going along with it. Are, yeah, are just like, okay, yeah. 
So, because what I, what I, I know fear some, is... I, I know some weird people. What <laughs> I, some freaky people. Yeah. What, a, <laughs> what, I, what concerned me was actually what you said, is that it's not actually authentic. And that... And often the open relationships that I know, it's the girl that's like, yeah, I guess that's okay. Right. And she's totally hurt by it. Right, that, that, that's, that's the thing where I would push back on the exactly. Is it somebody manipulating somebody else into actually believing, yeah. hey, man, this is the right thing to do or it's, it's, it's good? Or, yeah. or do they authentically really want it themselves? Mm-hmm. And, oh, okay, yeah, you're right. That doesn't make sense, right? There's a lot of, you know, there's a, there's a, 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 a give and take when we're dealing with values here, right? But if it's all take, 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 that's not, that's not ethics. That's, that's uh, tyranny. That's oppression. But what, but what would stop, what really stops the tyrant if there's not an absolute ethic against the wrongness of a thing? Now, You're stealing open, my open. thunder, Pastor. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, well, my, well my, my last example. No argument, be, Will, but, but my, 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 you know, physically, that's all you can do. My, my last uh, example is going to be something like euthanasia or, even more extreme, killing disabled people, okay? Uh, if enough people decided that that would be a way to help our society flourish, you know, lower medical bills for everybody, um, you know, whatever. Obviously, we can think of people in history who have actually thought this way. Um, if, if there is not an absolute right or an absolute essence to, to people uh, or to human beings or to values or work, and I'm not saying we would advocate for either one of those things, but if, if enough people agreed, if 99% of people voted, you said it wasn't democratic, but if they voted and said, hey, this is really what we ought to do, you know, um, how do we really stop that if we don't have an absolute value against that kind of activity? I would, I would say the only absolute value we have is that we value things, right? Everybody values something. You have, if you value anything, you value valuing, right? Um, because you, you wouldn't be able to value anything without that ability, right? And so if you kill disabled people because it'll be better for the you know, economy or something like this, you're killing their ability to value things, right? You're destroying their ability to value. You're treating them like things, right? And so to me, that's basically the only sort of, I guess, bedrock we have. That's why I'm talking about intersubjectivity. We're all subjectivities. We all are dealing with existence. I know you're, you know, I assume you are as well. I treat you like a person, not just a thing, right? Because I care about you because, you know, uh, you call out to me, you know, hey, man, answer this question, and, and I feel compelled to answer you. Right, um, so I can't stop you with a rational argument. I can't say, well, it's irrational to kill people, right? It's you know, it's there. They they have a right. I mean, that's 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 too abstract, right? But the fact that is, look, I know they're trying to cope with the same situation I'm coping with. Here I exist. I'm trying to find meaning and value in in my life. Who am I to say, you know, oh, because it might save me some tax dollars, I'm going to go ahead and, and do away with them, right? That would cancel out my right to value something. I have to value valuing, right? It can't be a complete uh, uh, tyrant like a Cortez or a conquistador or something like this. You know, to, to use the example from Simone de Beauvoir, right? The Cortez thinks that he can use the natives, right, to, to be the conqueror, right? But if he treats them like things, what is he conquering? You don't conquer things. So we can't treat objects, uh, we can't treat well, people like things. If you treat people like things, right, you basically have signed out of the moral community, Right? The moral community is based on the idea that people aren't things. Well, we are. We are objects, but we're also subjectivity, which can't be objectified, right? There's always something beyond that I can never get at, right? There's, there's a mind that you have that I can never see. I can never see the world through your eyes. I can never see myself the way you see me, right? And if I, and if, if I want to deal with you in a harsh and violent way, I'm denying that. I'm treating you as an object. Now, sometimes, like you said, how do we force people to stop killing these uh, people in the hospital uh, to save money for the, you know, euthanasia or whatever, right? Um, if we can't get at their subjectivity and convince them, right, uh, and I don't think you can do it with a rational argument. I think it's got to be from the heart. Um, if you can't do that, you gotta, you got to act on their objectivity by force, right? And so I think we're kind of all in this together. At the very least, we have to respect each other or else there's, uh, there's no values at all, right? Nothing can be valuable for me if it's not potentially valuable for someone. So, if I, if to be in the moral community, I have to um, treat others as um, moral ends. Let's well, put you it have that to way. treat them as as a person, which you means have to treat that, them as persons. Yeah, well, okay. which to me means that they're capable of making a judgment about you or me, and uh, you know. Is is this value system that we created objective? It's intersubjective. It's intersubjective. That's that means that it's it's all. That's why it's dynamic. That's why it's always changing. So, right? do people have to agree that I'm removed from no. the moral community? Uh, no. Okay. No. No. Like I said, it's not. So, a, it's not. It's not. It's not a. So democratic. if they don't have to agree, right? Then why is it intersubjective? It's intersubjective. Okay. Uh, 
objectivity comes from an agreement between scientists, right? If, if they establish objectivity, right, they're, they're coming together, right? They're, 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 they're looking at things they can measure, that they can verify through, you know, scientific experimentation, through quantity, through measurement, things like that, right? We're dealing with that sort of objectivity, right? When I say that ethics is intersubjective, I mean is you can't, you can't analyze ethics the way you analyze phenomenal, you know, tangible objects. You can't analyze ethics. Well, if you do it, you can do it historically, but all you're doing is you're talking about the history of ethics, how they developed. And even then, I'm suspicious. I think that, that that's overdetermined. I, I think a science of ethics like that would, it'd be fruitful. It'd probably tell us a lot about ourselves and our history. Um, but I think it's, there's so many factors involved, right? There's like, how did this, this person react to this, this, this thing? And how did that influence other people, right? Ethics is a, is a constant conversation. It's, there's never a knot that's okay. tied, right? Do, and, and in order for a conversation to happen, there has to be more than one person. Do people, tr- do people have needs? Do they have needs? Yeah. Um, what do you mean? Of course, we have needs like, uh, like given our brute sort of facticity, we have needs to eat. and, and, and yeah. to, So why, aren't, why isn't meeting those needs good and analyzable through? It's only good like insofar as you want to live. It's only good insofar as you want to be healthy. Right, but what if you hate life and you don't want to be healthy, right? Or um, again, I, I think we we've, we've been focusing so much on individuals here too. What about the good of the community? What if it's actually good that somebody dies because if they would have lived longer, they would have like done all these horrible things or something like this, right? Or cost a lot of money. Or cost a. Oh, there you go. Back to his example. Okay, but right, right. I want to ask you a question. Mm-hmm. So about say disabled people. Okay. okay. Uh, if, let's say a person is disabled or mentally challenged. They cannot fulfill their telos as a human being because they are not operating at maximum capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, and they cannot flourish in the way that Aristotle thinks human beings should flourish. Why should we keep them alive? So like the, uh, the horses stuck in their stalls that are sick, um, the, those horses probably could flourish if you removed them from the stalls and gave, brought, brought them back to health. They'd flourish just fine. Um, so with the somebody that's disabled, whatever it is that's disabling them, remove that and they'll flourish just fine. So the the potency that comes from our nature ends up being the same. Um, it's uh, there's not a a difference in um, in what a person is, regardless of whether they're actually fulfilling it or not. And oftentimes they're not the ones to blame for not fulfilling their 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 functions either. Uh, so so Aristotle wouldn't say. Oh, you can't fulfill your function. You can't flourish enough as a human being. Halt with you. No, uh, no. Aristotle would say that um, the uh, it's kind of where doctrine of double effect would start. So you can you might be able to let people die. Like you don't have to. It's not required that we grant everyone immortality, um, but uh, it would be um, it would be counterproductive to our to our function to say that this isn't a moral agent. So, so you're basically saying that your ethics excludes non. Um, I guess non-perfect specimens. Oh no, no, so, no. It, it has to inc- include non-perfect. Well, it includes them to exclude them. So, well, <laughs> basically, oh, they just can't be good, but it's not their fault. Yeah. So, it's Aristotle would say saying. one that most people aren't actually good uh, because good is to have these habits and be virtuous. And generally speaking, we're all still working on them. Second, it's usually said that Aristotle thinks no one is perfectly virtuous in any way, shape, or form. So that nobody actually is in that eudaimonia. But somebody who's in a wheelchair couldn't be quite as close to it as somebody who wasn't. It would, I mean, it would be hard to tell somebody that's in a, in a wheelchair. Of course it would be hard to tell them. Like you're, (laughs) yeah, so like, like, would you, would you say like, yeah, you're doing great. You're exactly the same as everyone else. If he was a really, if he was Stephen Hawkins, yeah. So. I'd be like, hey man, you were you were given a, a really uh, a difficult card. You were you were dealt a difficult card, and man, you really you flourished. And you know, so, I, I know you can't throw a javelin and 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 and, and win, win the Olympics with a pair of team of horses, but I think you flourished. Like you know, from my perspective, I think you lived a fulfilling and meaningful life. So so if you if you don't fit a, a some phenotype that's sort of like written into the code of nature, um, you are you just sort of out of luck. There's no way for you to live a fulfilling and yeah, so we all have things that still need to be fulfilled. Uh, so the of course. the fact that that Hawking couldn't walk around and didn't have wasn't uh, didn't have the the 
physical right. abilities meant that he was lacking physical abilities. Right. But but maybe those disabilities made him even a better person than he would have been otherwise. Like it, maybe, it could have been maybe. that he, he ended up perfecting other virtues. And right. really, what we honor him for so much is the fact that he he was he ended up getting dealt a really bad card and flourished nonetheless. Well, then it seems like it seems like you're agreeing with me, right? Like you know, earlier, you were saying that, that that there's a uniformity to what makes a person good, and now it seems like you're backing out. Like so again, you know, if I'm born with this disability, you know, maybe it's it, it's a, it's a sort of blessing in disguise, right? You know, like, like the famous, uh, there's a, a, a Zen Buddha, a Buddhist parable of the, the farmer, right, who uh, uh, he gets a, 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 a bull, comes onto his land, a beautiful steer, right? And his neighbors are like, oh, it's now it's yours, right? Mm-hmm. If it's on your property, you own it. That's really good. Yeah, so Aristotle... And he says, well, maybe it's bad, right? And while his son is breaking the bull in, right, like he gets thrown off of it and he breaks his leg. And mm-hmm. they're like, well, maybe it was bad. So like, in how do you know uh, Nicomachean Ethics chap- uh, chapter 10, uh, book one, chapter 10, um, uh, Aristotle doesn't just deal with the, uh, the those kinds of blessings. He says these are necessary, uh, but he also deals with uh, um, the um, the... Uh, curses. I don't know what other word to use on the spot. Um, it's called luck, yeah. it's called Solon's adage. So uh, King Solon uh, banned his peasants from selling themselves into slavery, and they revolted and killed him for it. So like, how is he supposed? How are you supposed to call him? Like, how, like, yeah, you flourished. He, he ended up doing great, and then he has this horrible event that kills his children and himself. And do we still say that he flourished? And Aristotle actually doesn't know what to do with it. Right. He just kind of shrugs and says, like, it, it, it was good up to a certain point. Right. Um, so okay. he, yeah, sorry. Okay. So, okay, we're out of, we're out of time uh, on that open discussion. So uh, if you have a question, if you could um, pass it toward the middle, and if I could ask one of my church members to kindly uh, pick them up and bring them forward. Um, while um, those are being brought forward, I want to announce, we, we happen to have uh, a second debate this week. Uh, doesn't always usually happen that way, but Saturday night we're having a debate on a very similar topic, actually. Uh, and the, the name of that debate is, which worldview produces the best world? So the idea is that we're sort of cashing out fundamentally different worldviews. Uh, one person is a, an atheistic naturalist, and the other is a, a biblical Christian. Uh, so each are ardent defenders of their worldview. Each have written books on the topic, published on the topic. Um, and uh, I expect these uh, two guys to really go after each other, and they won't be nearly as nice as these guys. <laughs> so there will be a lot of fireworks. It is free for college and high school students. I'm normally charging $10, which itself is a very low price. Um, it's the same price for you as it was tonight. So... Um, um, so uh, that's Saturday at 7.30. You can go to our church website, and if you have a student ID, you get in for free. I think you'll find it very interesting and very much in line with, with uh, the, the conversation tonight. So I know that we have to go, so we have about 20 minutes, um, and so uh, we're going to try to run through these. Uh, I'm going to try to go back and forth um, as quickly as we can. Take one minute to answer the question, and then you'll get a 30-second response. If the question's for you, you'll get 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we'll just start here, because uh, I can read the handwriting. Hmm. Question for Evan. Uh, do we get morality from nature? If humans come from nature and humans have morality, is morality what nature deems good? And what does nature deem good? Is it to thrive? Uh, yes. <laughs> so um, I guess just to elaborate, yes, morality then comes from... Um, from nature in that way. Um, uh, nature is what determines what is good, um, and it all uh, uh, revolves around the kind of creature that you are in order for how to how to function well. Okay, 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, I think that was more directed to him, but I, okay. I, I, I'd be really curious, to, does nature itself have a telos? Um, to exist would be its telos. Yeah, it would be kind of kind of bland. Okay, uh, I'm looking for one that's just for Travis. Uh, by the way, the last question, thank you, Jonas, for that. Micah asks this question to Travis. Is the world that worlds first created by society, follow-up? If so, are morals created by society, follow-up? This is the last follow-up I'm going to do. If so, could a society moralize murder? Okay, Uh 
so the first question was, does, is the world created by society? Yeah. Um, is the world that world? Yes. I, I, I would say that, that uh, what, what do you mean by society? Do you mean just sort of the, the I guess, all the people together interacting with each other? I, I suppose then the, the, the answer would be yes, if that's what you mean by society, right? Our, our sort of social interactions when we get together and we, we form political parties or we start a church or something like this. We're adding to the world, right? We're creating the world. But it's a back and forth, right? I mean, once we create these institutions, we aren't the only ones that shape them. They shape us, right? So it's a sort of a back and forth, right? There's a sort of plasticity, right? We impose these forms on our world, but these forms have uh, an effect on us, right, that is unforeseen, right? So it's sort of a, a, a give and take. Um, as to the last question, could, could a society be formed in which murder was... Um, um, I... I don't want to say no. I just think it would be it be a very far fetched. I, I think there would definitely could be societies where certain groups of individuals could be excluded and 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 deemed not necessary of life, and, and so maybe murder for a certain group, right? You make a racist society or something like that, but one where murder is just absolutely you know okay and good. Um, I could say maybe it's possible, but very far fetched. Thirty seconds. So this is kind of where I wanted that ex. A existence yeah. precedes essence thing because yeah. 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 I was going to try to corner you in a similar way. So, um, cause if, if we first we exist and we aren't already a thing, um, that we don't have an essence, the first thing we're going to, so that existence precedes essence, what this kind of means is that we're like just thrust into existence. Nobody asks to be born. They just simply are and you kind of have to deal with it. Um, the first thing you do is you look around and you learn. You're not, creating the, right yeah, so you're not creating anything you're right. discovering things right. and so okay. um the historical yeah dang. finish that sentence the historical origin of morality seems to have to be based in our observances which are going to be nature okay that from, sorry i just i want to keep us moving yeah, yeah, yeah. um from brian i think it's professor brian um question is aren't these virtues relative and an example, I believe, a racehorse is different, has a different telos from a workhorse. So, no, the, um, you even use the same species there. So, you're, you're on point. Uh, the, the telos of a racehorse and a workhorse, um, the most pristine, awesome, uh, pinnacle of horseness, uh, would be able to do both and beat both of those horses. And, yeah, no, that, that's, that's what it is. Don't give me that face. So that, that that's what we think is the best horse. It's this super horse that can do everything. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, what if you find out that there are things that horses can do that we're not aware of yet, right? You're going to keep having to, like, adding to your definition of, you know, what a perfect horse is? Oh. And that's the other thing, too. Nature reveals itself. We don't know everything about nature. Same thing about morality, right? It's, it's, it's an ongoing conversation that we're having with trying to find truth in a fuller version, a more complete version of truth. And it seems like... With your definition of virtue, like, you know, especially your response to his question, it's like, it seems like an infinite possibilities of what could be the perfect horse. It just seems like... All right. Very, very. Um, question, this is for both of you. I'm going to actually skip the third question on this. Uh, Travis, uh, you go first. This is something I didn't quite get to in my own questions. But another example, at what point does a baby receive the same rights as other humans? <laughs> Again, these are a lot of, like, we're dealing with a lot of normative questions, and I was trying to keep it on, like, the meta-ethical level, right? So you're asking me to, like, to, to decide, like, wh what are my values, right? I'm talking about where, where do values come from? What is the space in which they open up, right? Um, I would say that I wouldn't kill a baby because it, because I don't want to kill a baby, and it doesn't seem like it wants to be killed, right? It's a subjectivity that seems like if I tried to kill it, it would, like, freak out and be hurt, and I wouldn't want to do that, right? That's my only argument. I know it's not much of an argument as far as like a rational, objective argument, but uh, again, it calls out to me, right? It, 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 uh, w when I see it, it has a hold on me. And if it didn't, I, I guess I, I, I wouldn't see it as having any rights. So I think you're totally borrowing from my worldview. So you even said... No, I, I think there's a lot in common between... Yeah. yeah there's, you, you've even said like you, you look at it and you, you think that it wants to live. And that's my phenomenal... Like that's how I experience it. 
right? So, and you know that that thing is going to become like something else that looks exactly like all of no, these people. No, I don't of us. know that. I don't know that. I I, I assume that. But I don't know it. But okay. I do. What I do. What I do assume uh, even more strongly is that it is a conscious being that is capable of feeling pain and being in an agonizing situation that I don't want to impose on it. So because a- that would Aristotle, make me feel better. Aristotle would say that the, the 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 same potency, the same love for life that we see in infants is it exists through us through all of time. I, th- I think I agree. It comes from the gut. In a way, we're agreeing, you know, in a certain sense. Okay, question. This is, again, for both of you, but we'll start with Evan. Do you consider any validity from Tim, by the way, uh, any validity in the biological basis of morality as might be proposed by Edward O. Wilson and Sam Harris or Paul Bloom? And then how can morality be considered based in an objective reality when all of us, quote-unquote, interpret reality or rather define what reality is? So um, this would actually be a great uh, question for, for Professor Deere. Um, go talk to him afterwards. Um, Raise the, your hand, yeah. Mr. Deere. There you yeah. go. Okay. He's blind. Get really close to his face. So yeah. the um, – the, now I have to remember the question. Same uh, Harris. But, so, basis. yeah, Aristotle actually liked biology more than he did ethics and wrote way more on biology than he ever did ethics. Um, this is, it's absolutely a passion of his. Um, as from, uh, for, um, ethics from biology, um, the, uh, only in the sense that we're dealing with forms or that the, these formal causes, um, and then ultimately the telos that we infer from that. Um, but as for, uh, Sam Harris and, uh, and Owens, um, I'm actually not a fan of them as much. Um, they uh, they get too close to that is ought gap for me, that uh, that naturalistic fallacy, and so I, it makes me nervous. Uh, I'm I'm personally uh, a bit um, skeptical about uh, Sam Harris's um, uh, in de- his his what he's trying to accomplish, but I still think he should do it. Uh, so I'm actually all for it, right? This idea that, that you know, it, it seems like a plausible moral framework, right? If you assume that, okay, so there's this idea of well-being and science can a- analyze biology and determine what well-being is, but not only do you have the is-ought fallacy problem, but I think you, it's just overdetermined, right? There's too many factors involved. There's too many unique situations that I think eventually the science would just get too complicated. I hope I'm wrong, actually. I hope that maybe that, that, it, that I'm wrong about that and that they prove me wrong, but I, I'm rather skeptical. Do you want to know another translation for eudaimonia and flourishing? What? Well-being. Well-being, yeah, 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 right. <laughs> Right, exactly. I mean, so, yeah. so, so it could be, it could, like I said, it could work as a normative framework, but I still think, again, you're assuming that you understand what well-being is, and then I guess you could get more refined with some scientific experimentation, but then you're also assuming, okay, like, because this football player got these many concussions, like, and he got health problems later in his life, he should have been a football player. But what if he decided that that, that was the most rewarding experience in his life? Maybe he would assume it was worth the risk of his health, right? So that's another big problem, right? I mean, it's like, that's more of the is-ought problem, but I think even if you didn't have that, you still have the problem of nature is so complex, you know? And I think it's still also a problem for you, by the way. All right, a question again for both of you from Mahalia. Uh, does happiness equal good, and does good equal happiness? Oh, Who goes first? Oh, you go first. Okay, yeah, I, I would say uh, no. No, it doesn't. Uh, it depends on what you mean by happiness, depends on what you mean by good. Th- these words, again, um, to me, they don't have any meaning uh, by themselves. They require a context, right? You say something's good, you say I'm happy, or you just talk about pleasure, like I just feel good. Again, you need to be more specific before I can give you a straight answer. So uh, uh, yet another one of the translations for eudaimonia is happiness. Uh, but happiness is almost never chosen because it's just so associated with pleasure. And uh, Aristotle thinks that the uh, that a, a life where pleasure is the end is actually rather uh, um, uh, superficial. Yeah. yeah, It's beastly. He rejects it because it's the same life that a dog would go after, and we, we're not dogs. So the idea is that uh, so happiness only when um, concerned with fulfillment of function is, is how we succeed and where happiness would ultimately lie. Okay, question, Evan, for you. Uh, from Andrew, why is it necessarily immoral to not use an object for its intended purpose, i.e. to not let it flourish? Does pasta only flourish when it is eaten as we designed or intended it to be, rather than painted and used for kids' necklaces? 
So, um, actually, uh, this is actually a good question. So, um, and has a fantastic example with it. So, um, I would say that pasta is actually flourishing in both cases because we're growing it and it's flourishing and the species is, is promulgating. Like it's, it's a, uh, um, it actually is, as long as it's being used and it, it, the creatures around it, it's totally flourishing in its environment. Um, it's doing everything it's meant to do. Uh, there's actually great articles that talk about, um, <laughs> did we cultivate wheat or did wheat cultivate us? And intentionally words things in that way because the, it, wheat has never done better in, its, in, in all of history. I think it's yeah. a little both. I think we cultivated it and it cultivated us, right? It's, it's a part of this world that we create a sort of thing. It becomes a part of our society and it shapes us, right? So to, to, you know, and the thing is about the spaghetti, right? How do you determine what spaghetti was designed to be made into macrame, and, or not macrame, you know, little kid, little, oh, macrame, the pasta macrame, that'd be interesting, right? But yeah, uh, made into little, you know, uh, kindergarten uh, arts and crafts stuff. And how do you know that it was, it's, it was flourishing by ending up on my plate? Right? I, some pasta was designed to be arts and crafts, and some pasta was designed to be devoured. I... All right. Uh, question for you, Travis. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the question first, and I'm going to go back and read some of the, uh, some of the other verbiage here. This is from Thomas. Um, essentially, the question is, on what basis can one world judge the moral values of another? What makes one world bigger or better? Um, and he also says, if I'm not mistaken, your world notion is a kind of intersubjective, as mutually perceived, apprehension of phenomena as interrelated, and from these relations we phenomenologically infer what each thing is to us and all other things and subjects. Yet worlds change constantly and we judge them morally. So on what basis do we judge? 1930s Germany, for example. Right, right, right. We can only judge it from within our own world, and that's a big problem, I think. And, and so, you know, when two worlds, and I think this is a big problem with political discourse today, right, is that we have a nation of people living in essentially two different worlds, right, with two different sets of facts, seeing things with completely different values. Um, and how do you bridge that gap, I think, is the ultimate moral question, right? And the only way you can do it is to acknowledge the subjectivity of yourself, that you could be wrong, and that the other person could be wrong. Right, and it's only when things break down and your worldview kind of starts to not work that you can start to think of others. I think it's through art and literature, through great books like you know passages. For that. I think the Bible has great you know wisdom in it. The Tao Te Ching, all these great works. Right, these are ways that we can sort of look at each other, uh, you know, through through through, the, through these great works. Right, and, and maybe reveal other worlds. Right. But it's difficult. I, I admit, it's you know, you, once you're embedded in a world, you 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 know, it's it, you kind of mm -hmm. stuck seeing a way. Can you read the, the last, uh, the questions, just the, the yeah. last bit? On what basis can one world judge the moral values of another? What um, makes one world bigger or better? Yeah, so part of the, the thunder that Pastor was stealing from me was uh, the uh, idea of moral conflict. So one of, one of ethics' greatest things is that it's, it's the, the purpose of, of having an ethical framework at all. Part of that seems to be to solve conflict. So why is it that uh, um, when I... Uh, mug somebody on the street because I need some more Taco Bell. Um, is, yes, I'm going to reference Taco Bell even here. So the uh, uh, why why is that wrong? Why can't I just take... Uh, why is it wrong that I take his money? Uh, I want Taco Bell. So the uh, the idea is, is that ethics is supposed to kind of solve those problems. And it's supposed to take two creatures that are largely similar and explain why that doesn't work. Uh, question, Evan, for you. How do you know what is good? Is there a certain goodness in the form world for Plato, just like there is a perfect bottled water in the form world? Yeah, so this is, I think, where Aristotle uh, um, ends up being better than, than Plato. So it, part of the uh, uh, problem with Plato, and actually with, with Descartes' proof for the existence of God while I'm at it, um, is that this idea of like this perfect thing really existing out in this netherworld, communi communicating to us through these shadows that we call physical things, um, is just kind of ridiculous. So actually, uh, Aristotle dismisses uh, the idea that we need to define what is good. And then people like um, G.E. Moore, that creates the, the term naturalistic fallacy, actually says that the word good can't be defined at all. So what we mean by good has to do with um, the 
I don't want to say the word context because that's loaded in this situation. Uh, with the the, the telos uh, that a uh, an individual has, put it that way. Sounds like you're agreeing with me. Sounds like you're agreeing with me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, what was the question again? I uh, how do you know what good, what is good? Yeah. There are certain goodness in the form world. Oh, in the form world. Yeah, again, I, I, I'm kind of with you on, on, I don't want to dismiss Plato. I think the guy was brilliant. But, but, I, I do. But, uh, you know, you want to dismiss him completely, <laughs> just everything gone, right? Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I do, I do think that we need to, and, and you were mentioning how ethics is essentially, it, it's, it's, it's trying to resolve conflicts, right? And I think this idea of ideals and, I, you know, forms and moral absolutes is trying to, in that conflict with an easy answer that is over simple. And I think that that's why ethics can never be resolved, right? Because subjectivity is infinite, right? Until you die at least, right? It keeps going on. There's no finality, right? In order to decide whether, you know, even if you assume, okay, that this, uh, uh, you know, that there's this aim that's, that's a good aim and that if, if this object achieves that aim, it's good, right? You can't really judge that, um, without the process going through, right? Until it's, it's over. Right, you can't know whether or not it achieved its goodness until it's, it's done. Well, since our, you know, since existence is never final, right? It's not like a movie. You know, we don't just, you know, the credits don't roll at the end of the day. We can't judge whether it was a good movie or a bad movie, right? We have no sort of external or meta context with, from from to, uh, to judge it from. So, real quick, a Aristotle actually uh, would agree that you can't know until the end. Right. Um, and so, in virtue ethics, one of the big things is you find people that are towards the end. Um, towards the end of their life, and you, you find the ones that, that seem virtuous. You find the ones that seem happy, and then you start intentionally acting like them, and you'll, you find your own niche that way. So he actually says that, yeah, and eudaimonia isn't actually something that anybody under 40 would be able to experience right. to Aristotle. Right. Like, okay. you need to have your life complete. Last question uh, for Evan. Um, so it's a little bit long. Evan stated that a truly magnanimous man rises above the mob, is a, is a master, and follows his own heart, regardless of what the world thinks of his actions. Does this make him an egotist, such as Hobbes describes, rather than a moralist? So in Hobbesian terminology, no, he's still a moralist. Um, he still um, is looking... Uh, the, the things that he does, so let's take Solon for, for an example. Uh, the things, like, so, so when Solon um, wouldn't allow his peasants to sell themselves into slavery, uh, he was doing what is actually good for them. Uh, it's just that they didn't want what was actually good for them, so he kind of got a run of bad luck there. Um, the, um, um, the magnanimous person would do the same thing, and they wouldn't care what the, the consequences were. They would do what, what was right. Um, and uh, if they were really good at being magnanimous, then they'd be able to overpower things like that or see it coming and uh, things uh, to that nature. Um, so, but to, to answer slightly further, um, to Aristotle, yes, ethics is actually about um, if you are achieving your function. So it is, it's egoistic in that way. It is about you. Anything that actually has to do with um, how a community should live, he calls politics. So he splits the two in that way, such that politics is dealing with the virtues of a community okay. and ethics is dealing with the virtues I, of an individual. Part, I got, yeah, I got to disagree. I, I don't think that he separates the two. I think the thing about, pol for him, politics and ethics are two sides of the same coin, basically, right? That, that yes, you're right, the individual's fulfilling a function, but like, like I think, again, my concept of world, uh, for Aristotle, the human being is insignificant out of the context of the polis, the community. Right. So my function, if I'm if I'm a good carpenter or or a good warrior, there's that doesn't mean anything unless I'm in a community of other people where that's a function. Like the function uh, implies that you're doing something as a part of a whole totality. Right. So to me, and maybe also to save you a bit, right? Uh, this is an egoism, right? And essentially, even if you're doing it for yourself, your meaning only comes from the other, for other people, for the community that you're embedded in. So I I mean to to split it only in that there's a a book titled well, yeah, yeah, Ethics, yeah, right, 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 and a book right, titled right. Politics. Yeah, but they're so they're so intertwined. Yeah, and I don't think I would deny that yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah. I would actually say that the part of the form of a human being is a, so, as, a, as a social animal. animal right, he's a political social animal. political. Yeah, exactly. and yeah, we have to okay. fulfill that function as right. well. Just just to clarify. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, we are out of time. Um, reminder: debate Saturday night, seven thirty. Very similar topic. It will be free for you if you're a college student. Um, reception afterwards. It's in the building next door. Just. 
go to the, you can walk around the front all the way, go behind the big magnolia tree, and it's all the way down the hall, or you can go through the bell tower here, into the other, other, or walk down the covered walkway, and you'll find it. Just go, just go that way until you can't go that way anymore, and go find cookies. Please thank our speakers one more time, and thank you for coming out. Thank you.